welcome to the Roberts Law Office Injury Podcast. Kentucky attorney Jeff Roberts has over 25 years of experience. He'll provide answers to your questions related to personal injury and automobile accidents, workers' compensation claims, and Social Security disability benefits. Let's join Jeff for this episode. Friends, we're back in Murray, Kentucky, and we're going to talk to attorney Jeff Roberts, and today we're going to talk about the unfortunate situation involving traffic fatalities. Jeff, you've practiced motor vehicle injury law, personal injury law, for over 30 years now. So unfortunately, you've, you've handled a lot of these kind of cases because each one of them are tragic. But let's go ahead and open this up and, and talk about them a little bit. And I guess primarily we're going to focus on car wrecks, motorcycle accidents, and, and trucking collisions. These would be the large tractor trailer semi truck type, uh, type accidents. But uh, welcome to the podcast. I know it's not a happy topic, but it, it's one you know well. Uh, unfortunately, it is one I've known uh, well. I've represented several families who've lost loved ones as a result of a motor vehicle collision, whether it be motorcycle, uh, car, 18-wheeler. Uh, from that standpoint, there are not, uh, you know, th- those, unfortunately, are events that occur in our society uh, now. And so it, it's something that an attorney who does personal injury work like I uh, do has to deal with. Uh, periodically, and it's not a fun thing to do, but it, it, it's uh, at least I take uh, some solace in helping the family uh, move on and, and be able to to financially care for themselves even after the loss of a, of a loved one, possibly the breadwinner. Well, you know, as, as we break this topic down, I mean, there's probably some different categories or different ways to think about it. You've got your wrongful death claim, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's also a loss of consortium, and we'll have you talk about that and kind of some of the some of the specifics with that kind of claim. Uh, there is a pain and suffering uh, claim that comes along with that potentially, and then finally uh, we'll go back to stuff we've talked about before, which is um, UM UIM uninsured motorist and underinsured motorist uh, claims. All that kind of wraps up in, into this one kind of action. Correct. Yeah, uh, you can have all of those in when there's a uh, fatality as a result of a motor vehicle collision. Well, and, and that's that's what makes these things so complex is there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of different laws and a lot of different uh, factors that come into play. So um, why don't we just start with, um, you know, the, the normal traffic fatality. Again, this could be in a parking lot. This could be on, on a local roadway. This could actually be on a, on a highway or like the Western Kentucky or I-69 going through or 641 or any of these. Um Kind of what what should what should a family know? I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the injured victim calling you at this point. It's it's probably going to be a family member or a representative of the estate. How do, kind of how do you begin this kind of discussion? Well, uh, you know, you these discussions are best handled in person, in my opinion. So I what I tried to do is, is have the uh, the person come in usually uh, have multiple family members if I can come in to sit down and talk with me whether it's a surviving spouse and uh, if there's some adult children I try to have them come in it could be surviving spouse and maybe their uh, sister brother or another family member that comes in with them to to talk with me about these type of situations just because they are they are very difficult situations uh, very emotional situations for everybody involved uh from that standpoint and you know, while i tried to explain things to people in everyday terms i try not to speak in legal speak uh from that when you're talking to someone who's lost a loved one you know especially if it's been fairly recent then you know their focus may not be the best and having someone else there that can you know when they you know maybe later that evening or the next day or a couple of days later and said, well, I can't remember exactly what he said about this. And they can hopefully recollect, give them a better recollection or obviously they can call me back up and we can talk again. But, um, you know, frequently it's, it's just good in my opinion to have somebody else there with, uh, with us when we're having that conversation. I think so. And I think that's part of the value of these podcasts is we're going to provide some very basic information that somebody can refer back to. And that might, kind of underscore something that you've already discussed. Maybe they were uh, had a couple of questions later, or they're trying to explain it to a family member, and sometimes something like, hey, let me share this podcast with you. Right. It kind of give you a general overview may, may help. Yes, that's what, I mean, what you and I both try to do in these podcasts is to give people information that they can use, 
you know, obviously they're still free to contact me and Absolutely. call me, and I want them to if they got a case from that standpoint. But sometimes people just want a little bit of information, and that's the reason I put out these podcasts. Well, let, let's begin with the wrongful death claim. And generally, I mean, you, you've got a fatality, and this could have happened at the accident scene, or this could have been somebody who passed away, unfortunately, later on at a hospital or even down the road subsequent to the, uh, the injury and the accident itself. Start us off with a wrongful death claim. Wrongful death case in Kentucky, basically, uh, in, any death caused by negligence can, can result in a wrongful death case. In Kentucky, if it's from a motor vehicle collision, then you have the wrongful death claim that uh, is pursued by the estate, but the money really doesn't go to the estate. The money goes to certain beneficiaries specified under the wrongful death statute, spouse and children, um, uh, from that standpoint as a general rule, uh, minor children. And then the, um, so that's how, you know, that's where the money goes. It's basically uh, the loss of earning capacity of the person who passed away is the primary uh, damage in a wrongful death case. Uh from, from that perspective, and it's uh, so you pursue that. Whoever's the administrator of the estate is the one who technically pursues it, even though the money doesn't go to the estate. It's it's somewhat weird in how that is. So it might be the, the person who's administering the estate, or maybe it's the executor, they would actually hire the attorney? Correct. In, probably in consultation with the family, I would think. I would assume so. And most of the time, the, the, whoever's administering the estate is uh, is the next to the closest next to Ken, a lot of times. Anyway, that's the situation. So it, you know, it's it could be the surviving spouse who's the executor of the or executrix of the estate, and they hire the attorney as well. Uh, so they are a beneficiary because they are uh, the surviving spouse in that setting. But if you've got, you know, if if it's a cousin who happens to be a a an accountant, and that's who you designate as being the executrix or executor of the will, then the that that person would be the one to hire the uh, attorney to handle the wrongful death claim, even though they're not. Rec- it would be the ultimate, somewhat the ultimate decision maker on settlement. No, even though they're not the ones who is actually receiving any of the funds. And, and sometimes, just from an emotional standpoint, that might be nice to have that buffer there. Somebody can see the the situation clearly. I would think, rather than the spouse who's just lost a spouse or or the minor child who's. Maybe, maybe not even able to, to make these decisions because they're so young. It's, it's nice to know that somebody else can help guide that, that, that decision process. It, it certainly can be beneficial, especially if, you know, if, if it's minor children and if, you know, the only living parent's one who dies as a result of negligence, then having a, you know, a family member who obviously is looking out for the best interest of the minor child but also has uh, the proper financial knowledge and things of that nature to to make sure the money is because the money in that situation, the money doesn't go to, you know, if you got a six year old minor child, they don't get it then. Right. Uh, so making sure the money is preserved and, and hopefully grows over the period of time until they reach age of majority or even after, if you structure the settlement, it, it, having somebody there, certainly the attorney that, that is handling the case should be uh, looking out for those interests as well. Uh, from there, but having an executor that has that knowledge can be very helpful. Absolutely. So with the, um, I mean, this is handled in civil court. This is handled as generally an outgrowth of the of the motor vehicle accident. Um, is there any specific nuance, or is there anything different about a wrongful death claim? I mean, obviously, the evidence has to be has to be gathered up. I'm trying to figure out who's the negligent driver, so you know, you know who's involved and what party is potentially responsible in terms of the financial side of it, but it's a lot more than just the finances. I don't want to seem that crass, but a lot of times it does come down to insurance. It, it, well, it does come down to insurance in, in some respects from that standpoint. There are different uh, aspects of it when there's a motor vehicle collision um, that come in. A lot of it's going to be the same as any motor vehicle collision. You know, who's at fault? Uh, those type of things, you know, proving causation that the accident is the cause of the injury or death, uh, as the case may be. Um, if there is, you know, if the person you mentioned earlier, you know, they may die immediately, they may die later on, be in the hospital and, you know, for a week or two before they pass away. And you can, 
then that presents, in addition to the wrongful death claim, a, a claim for uh, basically the pain and suffering of that individual for that period of time that, that does belong to the estate. There, that money would go to the estate and be distributed according to either the will or the laws of the, uh, of Kentucky in that regard if somebody dies without a will. The So, you know, you've got to look into that aspect of the case as well for the family um, from there. And uh, there are... You know, you've got, the, we've talked frequently about PILP that can help pay medical bills associated with it. Uh, that's, other, that, that's that no-fault insurance we yeah. have here in Kentucky, personal injury protection. Correct. Yeah. That, that PIP is. The yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, frequently we talk about PIP being used for um, for medical bills and or lost wages, but there are other things it can be used for in a wrongful death claim just some of the times where that can come in to be used for some other things. Uh, replacement services loss and stuff like that. Uh, and, and so you've got to look at all of those aspects of that uh, of that situation uh, as far as the claim over the death. And then uh, you mentioned this earlier is the loss consortium uh, claim, and that's a claim that uh, a surviving spouse has over the loss of a, a spouse or a minor child has over the loss of a parent or a parent has over the loss of a minor child uh, from that standpoint. And loss of consortium, basically, uh, you, you frequently uh, it's referred to as the loss of love and affection uh, it is kind of the way that's talking about it. You know, uh, and there's more than, uh, you know, the companionship of the spouse, comfort, and all of those things. There's a lot that comes into a loss of consortium claim. Uh, from there, uh, from that standpoint, but if 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 a negligence, if a car wreck and the other driver's negligent, then there is that claim in addition to the wrongful death. Then the surviving spouse, minor children, etc., could have a loss of consortium claim. And and how does this work? I mean, Jeff, you've got you know, okay, so you've got a wrongful death. We keep calling it a claim, and then you've got a loss of consortium claim. Do these stair stack? Do these just kind of make the if it's a jury verdict and make it potentially larger, I mean, kind of what, what are we, or a settlement, you know, is it, do these extra actions actually increase the value of the situation? Certainly. I'm just trying to, yeah, I mean. It I, certainly can because the, you know, it could be that you're limited by policy limits. Sure. Sure. Uh, in regard to certain aspects, so it may not limit it a great deal. It depends on how the policy limits are written. If it's per person, per policy limit, uh, t- it can make a, come into bearing on those type of cases. Um, and I, I think there is, uh, at least my view is a loss of consortium claim is separate from a uh, wrongful death and you get a separate per person type uh, damage there so it can increase the recovery from that standpoint. Some disagree with me in that. I don't know of a Kentucky uh, appellate decision that has addressed that issue directly that I'm aware of uh, from there, but I, I, I know uh, been successful in arguing uh, to insurance companies in that regard. So it, it can affect the recovery from that standpoint, but there's, you know, each and every person has uh, that that can, can be involved in that can uh, come in to look at that. You know, there's a, and um, the loss of consortium, you've got the infliction of emotional distress, potential claims there as well. Uh, there. Now, the loss of consortium is more of a derivative claim yeah. than the, the negligent infliction of emotional distress. So. And as we were preparing for this, I think you also wrapped up in the loss of consortium. There's a loss of services, and, they, and that can be support around the household. That could be all sorts of different things that can come into that. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, that's part of that. Is, is so it's not comes just the love and affection. Yeah. There are other aspects. Well, yeah, that all kinds of falls. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All falls under the loss consortium uh, from that standpoint. So uh, in the negligent infliction of emotional distress, especially if you're in the car and see yeah. the loved one, those type of things can come in. And that happens. Uh, it does. And, and uh, so those are situations where that can come in to play in these type of, of cases uh, as well. And, you know, of course, minor children who lose a parent, and you know that is uh, one of the 
aspects of these cases is helping the jury to understand these type of damages. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I certainly cannot understand what a minor child goes through who loses his parent because I've never experienced that. Uh, but there are experts in these fields who can who have counseled lots and lots of children who have who can you can uh, get involved to present that to the jury so the jury can understand or to the insurance company so they can understand better what that child's loss has been uh, from uh, as a result of their the other driver's negligence um, and that's where the attorney one of the things the attorney uh, does or should be doing is to do that to make sure that the recoveries are there for that family to help. Because when you lose the major breadwinner, you know you you may have other avenues, or maybe some life insurance, or maybe uh, and should be some social security benefits potentially coming in for the surviving spouse uh, in that uh, situation, and for minor children potentially in that situation. But those, you know, uh, the survive, uh, social security benefits usually nowhere near what it ought to be uh, or enough to to go back to the same standard of living. Life insurance runs out, can run out very quickly. So having a good uh, uh, a recovery there can help. Uh, you know, and I've had this situation where the, the main breadwinner died in a car wreck and, you know, the, the spouse was a stay-at-home spouse taking care of the kids and, and and that was a decision the spouses had made together in getting money to allow them to continue to stay at home and, and raise their children until the children reached 18 was something that they really really were wanting to do because that's what they wanted to do and they, they wanted to do that even before the spouse died but then after the spouse died they wanted to continue to do that in honor of the spouse's wishes in their their agreement or you know what they had discussed beforehand uh in in you know so you know if you have a the breadwinner who passes away and the other spouse is uh, is at home uh raising the children from that standpoint that's uh frankly the my viewpoint that's the more important job of the two uh there and that's one that they need that they i've had several clients who the the spouse whether it be male or female want to stay home and continue doing that and and really one of the things that stressed them out was uh caused them a lot of mental stress was am i going to have to find child care and you know instead of being here when my kids get off the school bus so alone possibly all yeah. these all these different things because exactly. that financial picture changed substantially correct yeah wow now, do you? I guess you bring in financial experts to talk about the earnings capacity of that of the deceased individual. Does that does that come into play as well? Yes, a vocational expert and an econo economist, both usually, or one that does the uh, one that can is capable of doing both uh, in one testimony. Yes, and, and that's a legitimate factor in deciding what what is the ultimate value of this of this settlement or or this this oh, ideally the jur the jury verdict, because that that number matters. I mean, that's a real number that's impacting. The family, you know, Correct. the surviving family. Yes, exactly. It's a, it, that's a huge factor uh, from that standpoint. And so that that's a huge part of the loss there. Now, frankly, in Kentucky, you know, Kentucky's wrongful death statute ought to en encompass a lot more than that, in my opinion, but it doesn't. So, but there, so right now, that is a huge part of the loss in Kentucky for wrongful death action uh, from that. I, I want to come back to this before we go beyond it. Uh, the loss of consortium, you mentioned that that is spouse for a deceased spouse. That's a parent for a deceased minor child, and that is a child, a minor child for a parent. It's the it's the child who's eighteen or older that's kind of left out of that claim. Is that right? It, it, under current law, that's yeah, my, yeah. That's my understanding. The current law is that adult children cannot get loss of consortium for loss of a parent. And a parent cannot get a loss of consortium for loss of an adult child. That's one of kind of the hole in that whole that whole grid, if you will. There's kind of a hole there for the Correct. for the majority aged. In my opinion, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so too. Um, one thing that we've talked about quite often, and uh, by the way, friends, I, I'll link back to some of these uh, some of these episodes that you may have previously listened to to make it very easy to tie all this together, is the uninsured motorist or the underinsured motorist claim. And that is still viable. This is still an auto accident. Correct. This is still a motor vehicle accident. Yes. 
So, yeah, if if the at-fault driver's insurance is not sufficient to cover the total damages, then you can look at the underinsured motorist coverage to kick in. At-fault driver doesn't have insurance, then you can look at the uninsured motorist to kick in and pay uh, at that point in time. And, you know, it, a lot of times in Kentucky, because Kentucky uh, is a mandatory insurance state, but the bodily injury minimum limits are 25000 and a lot of people have minimal limits or, you know, in when you have these type of injuries, uh, frequently, very frequently, uh, the limits of coverage are not sufficient to cover all the damages that are out there. Well, what's kind of interesting is that that, that $25,000 level was set back in the 70s. Yes. And I dare say medical treatment and some other things have uh, have gotten a lot more expensive these days. So it's kind of funny that hasn't kept up with the times. Yeah, the, the 25000 liability limits and the 10000 PIP limits were all set back in, I believe, 77, but I may be wrong, but it was the 70s that it was set in. Uh, there's been some proposals to increase it, but it's not uh, made its way uh, through the legislature and, and be signed by the governor. So it's not a law yet uh, from that standpoint. But you can purchase more Additional. insurance. Yeah. You can yeah. you can, you don't have to get 25. You can get 50, 100, 300, or higher. Uh, uh, from that, you just got to talk to your to your uh, agent, your I your guess. agent, and get to get that type of coverage and let them know that you're wanting that. And the same with the underinsured and the uninsured. A lot of times that will track whatever your liability coverage is. If you got $25,000 of uh, liability bodily injury, then you probably only have 25000 of underinsured and uninsured. I've never seen one that had underinsured and uninsured higher than the liability limits uh, that the person had. So, uh, you know, making sure you have good coverage for the uninsured, underinsured is something that you need to look at on your policy. The liability protects your financial resources uh, from that standpoint. If, if you're at fault, the uninsured, uninsured, uh, underinsured protects you when the other driver's at fault, but your damages will exceed what their li- limits are. Right. And, and friends, once again, we'll, uh, we'll I'll put some links in the, uh, in the show notes there so that you can find those episodes fairly quickly. Um, Jeff, let's, let's, this is episode 57. Back in episode 55, we talked about statutes of limitation, and that is that certain period during which you have to actually file that claim. How, how is that handled in a, in a wrongful death claim or traffic fatality? Does this, does this come back to it's, it's a motor vehicle accident, so we've got that two years? or? Uh, well, at least the way I view it, I think you've got one year from the date the administrator is appointed for the estate, but no greater than two years. Okay. Um, the uh, there's an argument that the MVA increases it, as I said in that episode when we talked. I always are on the earliest possible date for the statute of limitations. So I don't on a wrongful death case. I don't uh, I, I don't go by the two year deadline. I go by the what would be the wrongful death deadline for any type of wrongful death, and that is uh, two year or one year from the date the administrator is appointed, no greater than two years from the date of the uh, the accident that caused the death. Uh, from that standpoint, so I, I like I said, I, I err on the side of caution on those matters. So. Yeah, yeah, no, and that makes sense. You use the you, the abbreviation MVA. We're talking motor vehicle accident. Yes. Real, real simple in that, yeah. in that regard. Um, And then we also, in episode 52, we had just talked about, um, this is the, I'm sorry, 56, that was the previous episode, talked about contingency fees. And, um, you know, again, when it comes to hiring an attorney for a motor vehicle accident, uh, the good news is there's no money out of pocket. And so a lot of families are already in in just a massive confusion. They're looking for answers. I'm not sure how this is going to work out for them or if they can afford to hire an attorney. The good news is in the state of Kentucky, they don't have to worry about that right now. Correct. You, you, if you contact an attorney about handling these type of cases, uh, in all likelihood, they're going to handle the case on a contingency fee agreement. If they don't handle it on a contingency fee agreement, it's not probably not an attorney who does a lot of personal injury work, and you might want to contact somebody else. A uh, contingency fee agreement basically means the, rec- the fee is contingent upon the recovery. The attorney would get a percentage of the recovery, 
from there. Most, or not most, but a lot of attorneys advance the litigation expenses, and, and those are also contingent upon recovery. Uh, that's the way I do uh, handle these cases. The attorney fees contingent upon recovery. The expenses are contingent upon recovery. So if I'm successful, I get paid the attorney fee and reimburse the expenses. Some attorneys, uh, the attorney fee can be contingent, but then the expenses are always the client's responsibility, even though the attorney advances those. They, they will get those back at the end. Uh, and and they, they have to tell you when you sign up that, how that is. Uh, from that standpoint, but a lot of attorneys handle it like I do, and that is the expenses are contingent as well on recovery uh, from that standpoint. So No, the, in, in, but the good news is, you know, this is going to be a complicated situation. I mean, you know that already. Your family has been extremely impacted by this by this uh, situation. The last thing you need to be worried about is can we afford to hire a lawyer? The good news is yes, yes, you absolutely can. Jeff, you have two offices. You have the office here in Murray, Kentucky, down in Callaway County, and you also have another office up in up in Christian County in Hopkinsville. Um, but you're not limited to this area. You've actually handled cases all across the Commonwealth. Yes, I've handled cases uh, from Paducah to Pikeville, just yeah. just nearly. Uh, from that standpoint, I've handled I've handled. Uh, cases been contacted by attorneys in eastern Kentucky that wanted to associate with me on cases uh, from that attorneys in northern Kentucky in the Louisville Lexington area I handle cases all over the Commonwealth of Kentucky uh, from that standpoint frankly uh, one uh, w with the uh, a lot of the courthouses going to video proceedings as a result of COVID that's actually made it uh, my drive time less on some cases because I don't have to drive to the courthouse as much. I can uh, video in, which it makes it easier and less expensive for clients for me to handle cases further away uh, from from that standpoint. So that is, you know, a, it, as far as sitting down with, and it also helps because there, there are some clients that I do like face to face communications, either sitting down in person in my offices or. Uh, now we can do that on the computer or on their phones uh, where we can be face-to-face -face and look at each other when we're talking to each other, which, right. which I appreciate. Well, you, you, you mentioned this in passing, and, and, I, and I know why you do it because I, I know the kind of person you are, but what, it, what is really interesting is your peers, other attorneys, regularly call you to get involved in cases they're handling, and, and I think that says a lot about your experience, your track record. I think it also says a lot about the respect they have for you as, as, a, as an attorney. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how that happens with um, with the attorney fees in, in, in those situations. You're not actually incurring more fees just because Jeff were to get called in, but at the same time, the fact that other attorneys are calling Jeff might be a good reason for you to call Jeff. Uh, That's yeah. my shameless plug for you, Jeff. You caught that. <laughs> I appreciate that. The uh, Yes, uh, yeah, if uh, another attorney calls me up and associates with me on a case that does not increase the fees for the client, what it does is the that attorney and myself will agree among ourselves how that attorney fee is going to be. So if they're handling the case on a one-third contingency fee, then the client's still only paying one-third of the recovery for attorney fees. Uh, if I do two-thirds of the work on the case, I get two-thirds of the fee. Or or what, if we make an agreement ahead of time that it's going to be a one-third, two-thirds, or a 50-50 split, whatever it is, uh, that's between me and that other attorney. Uh, in that regard, the fee to the client is not does not increase because there's a second attorney involved in that. Right. Outstanding. Jeff, do you have any closing words, any final thoughts on these kind of cases? I, I know these are these are these are as we said at the outset, the, these are tragic situations and it's it's just unfortunately they happen. They happen, you know, yeah. all across the state. Well, one thing that we haven't talked about in, in regard to these type of cases, and I, and we I think we've touched on it a time or two in some other motor vehicle cases. Uh, but what one thing we also look at in especially in these type of cases because the damages for the family are so huge uh, when you've lost a, a loved one like that is we look at try to look at other claims outside just the motor vehicle case against the other driver and so you can have in these type of cases sometimes what's called a product liability case against the manufacturer of the vehicle that That's you're in. Could be a crash worthiness uh, aspect if, if the vehicle uh, was unsafe in some regards. Um, that And that's what caused the uh, 
death to be you know the person to die as a result of the collision when they shouldn't have died. Well, years ago they had all those Firestone tire cases where the the, the tire itself was defective. The, the tires was defective, or uh, you know the uh, Ford Pinto cases uh, from a long time ago where they exploded in rearing collisions, side saddle gas tanks, and different types of crashworthiness issues where the 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 way the vehicle would, uh, you know, there was a defect in the vehicle or in the either in the way it was manufactured or in the design itself of the, of the vehicle or a component part like the tires. And so you look at those type of claims to see if that could have played a role. It could be a, an issue with the roadway itself yep. uh, that could have called, been a substantial factor in causing the collision. Uh, from that, and so you could have a potential claim there. You know, I've had cases where I've sued the Commonwealth of Kentucky because of uh, collisions that occurred at intersections because they didn't have proper signal lighting and things like that. So you've got, you look at all of those type of cases that can come into play. So it may not just be a claim against the at-fault driver or your own insurance for underinsured. There may be other entities, other parties that are also responsible for this collision occurring. Well, and I, and I believe in a previous episode, we, we were talking about trucking accidents. These are collisions with tractor trailers or involving tractor trailers where a piece of equipment or something has come off of the flatbed and caused damage to the car behind it or even right. fatality behind it. And that could not only open up the, the trucking company and that driver, but also maybe the people who loaded that trailer and all sorts of different things. I mean, so again, having somebody with your level of experience who knows how to approach this and go, okay, wait a minute. Uh, it's not just this small case. It's actually a whole bunch of other parties here. We have to be prepared to take that on. Correct. Exactly. That is the uh, thing is looking at the potential parties, uh, potential negligent parties uh, from that standpoint to make sure all the proper avenues of recovery are uh, are there. And, you know, that's uh, one of the things when you're in law school, they teach you is, is issue spotting. That's one of the things on law school exams is they want to make sure you're spotting all the issues that are there presented by what that fact scenario they present in that law school exam. And that is partly because they don't want an attorney, somebody to become, a, you know, go through law school, become an attorney, and then not realize when they're talking to potential clients, oh, not only do you have a claim against the person who ran the stop sign, but your airbag should have went off and it did not go off, so you got a potential claim against the auto manufacturer or, uh, you know, your your tire blew out when it shouldn't have blown out and it caused you to call, you know, cause your vehicle to roll over and hit another car where the other driver wasn't at fault, but you really weren't at fault either. It was the manufacturer of that tire that caused that or it was installed incorrectly or something. So being able to spot those and uh, advise the clients about all of the potential causes of action is something that that the attorneys should be doing when they're talking to their clients. Well, and that's where you get into a situation where there could be multiple, multiple parties involved in this litigation that you're going to go up against, and you're not afraid to step into that ring. I mean, that, you know, sometimes these are really, really big companies. But, uh, again, you've got not only the confidence, but also the skill and the knowledge to really kind of guide that case through and uh, and ultimately do the best you can for that client. Uh, correct. Yes, I uh, I've been involved in all types of those cases that that we've talked about tire failures, uh, things of that nature from that standpoint, and that's the reason I you know somebody calls up with a divorce question. I don't know anything about divorce, and I will refer that out uh, to somebody else or tell you know have them contact somebody else uh, in things of that nature. So you know if I'm not comfortable with the case i'm going to let the person know that and that's the reason i limit my practice to what i do is because that uh, that lets me uh keep up to date with the 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 best way to handle those cases the latest information on those type of cases uh from that standpoint and give my clients the best representation that i can outstanding jeff i appreciate your time and friends if you're listening to this and you're thinking well you know, just over in Murray, um, and, and I don't live in that area, do yourself a favor. Remember what we talked about of the fact that other attorneys across the state, across the Commonwealth, are contacting Jeff on a fairly regular basis because of his skills and knowledge. At the same time, if you want to read through some of those Google reviews, you'll kind of see the trust and the comments that Jeff has 
basically earned from handling a lot of complicated cases for a lot of different people. And you'll kind of get a sense for the type of person that Jeff is. And I, you know, I've worked with Jeff for many years now, and I just I, I can't tell you how much I respect the way he not only runs his his uh, personal life, but also his law practice here. And I think those Google reviews will absolutely echo those sentiments. So, Jeff, once again, thank you for your time, and I look forward to publishing this episode out just as quickly as we can get it out there. Thank you, and thank you to the listeners. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Roberts Law Office Injury Podcast. Jeff will return in two weeks. Until then, he invites you to visit jeffrobertslaw.com and follow his firm on Facebook. At the Roberts Law Office, you'll find a history of a small-town service and big-city results.